So 150 years after Darwin proposed that microevolutionary processes could explain macroevolution, we, stu we do still consider this very seriously as a possible explanation for very complex traits. And what we've seen so far is that selection will operate on whatever trait is available. So in the case of the mollusks, you have simple pigment spots, which can then be modified to become much more complex organs to become eyes. And what we want to look at now is the fact that these traits can start out having one function, that is, they serve one purpose, but through time, their function changes. Let me give an example. Pandas are carnivores. They're related to bears, okay? And bears generally walk around, and they don't hold things in their paws. But the panda has a very, very specialized diet. It only eats bamboo. It has a very typical way of eating the bamboo. It plucks off the plant, and then it strips the leaves, and then it chews on the stem. Okay, now to do that, it has to hold on to its bamboo very, very precisely. And it has a thumb, but the thumb is not the equivalent of the primate thumb. Instead, it has a wrist bone that has become enlarged, lengthened, and has associated muscles. And that simple wrist bone now serves like a sixth digit coming off the panda's forepaw that it used then to grab onto bamboo. Our own ears consist of a series of bones in our inner ear that originally were part of our ancestors' jaw bones. So if we look at the skull of a reptile, there are certain bones found where the jaw actually attaches to the skull, and they have complicated names they don't really care about. What we do care about is that if we look at these bones and how they're placed and how they're shaped through the evolution from early reptiles to mammals, these bones have been modified. And here's a fossil from 123 million years ago where the bones that are eventually going to become the middle ear are now this enlarged hinge. Okay, So they're still here as a hinge. And then they moved away. They got separated away from the jaw, detached. And then they form the tympanic ring, the hammer bone, and the anvil in the inner ear. So these are bones that have been jerry-built again. They started out on the jaw, and now they're serving a very different purpose. If we look at flight, if we first look at flight in vertebrates, we have the bats and the birds both have wings, but these are modified forelimbs. So there's the foreleg of a cat, there's our upper arm, frog has a foreleg, whale's flipper, etc. The bat's arm and its fingers have been modified so that it holds out that membrane for the wing. A bird's wing is likewise the forearm, and the hand bones have become very reduced, modified, and they support feathers. Okay? So these are things that originally were used for walking, but then they became used for flying. However, it's interesting in thinking about flight what happened in insects. Insects are the third group that can fly. And they have wings, but they're not derived from their forelimbs. All insects have six legs, and some of them have wings. Some have two, and some have four, but they're not because the legs got modified. These grow out of their back. And it turns out that these wings were originally gill flaps. So here's a group of insects called stoneflies, and the simplest, what we would say the more primitive stone fly has these gill flaps on the back of this middle segment of the body or from the thorax. And these have been lengthened and these eventually are what developed into wings. Now again, one might ask, what use is half of a wing? Why can we possibly accept the possibility that you've got these very simple gill flaps that somehow got longer and longer and it would be impossible to fly until the wings are way out there. Well, let's look at some modern stoneflies 
and let's watch their behavior. Stoneflies live next to bodies of water, streams, small ponds, and they're so small that they can actually float on the surface of the water. And they can get from one part of the riverbank to another by traveling on the water. Now, with their wing flaps, if they raise their wing flaps, they can catch a breeze. So the breeze is going to be blowing from right to left. They've got their wing flaps up, and oh, yeah, I'd like to go over there. And so now they're able to get an assist from the wind. Another species of stonefly that has somewhat longer gill flaps, it can't fly yet, but it has yet longer gill flaps. And so it can really pick up the wind, okay? If they need to go further, if there's an advantage to being able to really whoosh along in a slight breeze, those individuals with longer wind flaps would benefit. Then finally, here's another species. It still can't fly, but now its gill flaps are mobile, so it can create its own breeze. It doesn't have flight, but it's on its way. So here again, small intermediate steps, slightly longer, slightly larger, confer an advantage until finally then a whole new use of those gill flaps is possible. They don't have to stay on the surface and catch the breeze, they can make their own breeze and then those with even longer ones could take off and go into the air.